Bibles, please, to John. John chapter 18. John 18. I want to read a few verses. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. Last week, uh, Pastor Yvette was sharing on the first 11 verses, and I'll start with verse 12. And so the soldiers, their commanding officer, and the temple guards arrested Jesus, tied him up, and first they took him to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at that time. Caiaphas was the one who had told the other Jewish leaders, it's better that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of the the disciples that other disciple was acquainted with a high priest so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus verse 16 Peter had to stay outside the gate and then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching at the gate and she let Peter in the woman asked Peter you're not one of that man's disciples are you no he said I'm not because it was cold, the household servants and the guards made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warm, warming himself. And then the, the next, verses 19 to 24, the high priest's uh, questions for Jesus. Verses 25 onwards is the uh, second and third denial of Peter. And then we have Jesus' trial before Pilate. And I just want to have a few words uh, to read there. Um, Pilate, verse 33, went back to his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked. And Jesus replied, is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted, your own people and the leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate asked, so you're a king? And Jesus responded, you say I'm a king? Actually, I was born and came in the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. Verse 38, what is truth? Pilate asked. And then he went out again and the people and told them, he is not guilty of any crime. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths, the great central truth of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we can stand on that truth. We commit now to you this word, this day, in Jesus' name, amen. When I was going through this passage, it's a number of items to look at. And one of the things that keeps coming up is this issue of trial, because it is, in fact, the trial of Jesus. But as I work it through, I want us, and as I read it, this is how I read Scripture, I always ask, Lord, what's in it for me? How do I grow? How do I grow closer to you? It's a book of faith. John writes and says very clearly that the whole purpose, in chapter 20, verse 31, the whole purpose is that we grow in our faith and believe uh, either to continue to believe or actually begin to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so uh, I, I trust that in the next uh, few minutes that we're together, our faith in Christ will grow. That's the purpose of this, growing in faith. But with faith, with faith comes something else. It comes a bit of trial. And then we ask ourselves the questions, are trials of God or are they of men? And what's the outcome of trials? Because Jesus here and Peter and others will find out, go through trials. And so you and I go through trials. And all of them have one purpose. And so I've, I've looked at this today and I've got four different trials that are before us. The first trial is that it's a mock trial of um, Peter. If we could have the next slide advance there, Elton, thanks. Uh, it's, it's a mock trial and it comes up into two sections. Then you've got Peter's trial. Okay, he's actually on trial. Then you've got Jesus' trial before Pilate. And then fourthly, very interesting, there is a trial before Jesus. And we have to see it that way as well. We'll, we'll uh, get to that at the end. Let's look at the first one, this whole thing of the mock trial. 
In verse 12, um, we, we know what happens here from last week. You got this. They were in, in the garden, if we could use this term, minding their own business. They're just praying, doing their things. And here comes a whole cohort of soldiers to arrest Jesus. And uh, in verse 12, it says, So this cohort and the commanders and the officers of the Jews, they arrest him and they bound him up. And Jesus doesn't have a sword. He's never had one. He's got no reputation of ever even attacking anyone, nothing at all. And they bind him up. You're like, really? For what? For what? Well, they got all kinds of information. Now, what, what, obviously, as we'll see, it's false information, but they just, well, they just heard something. These guys were paid soldiers. They're civil servants, servants of the uh, leaders, and so they're doing what they're told. So they go, and in fact, that's when they fell back when Jesus said, who are you looking for? Well, Jesus, oh, I'm, I'm him. They're like, what? And they actually fall on that. And uh, anyways, they get up, they do their duty. They're just paid to do that. They, they bind him up and they take him. Now, what's interesting is that where do they take him? Well, they take him now. This is at nighttime. They're praying at night. There's no court at night. Courts aren't open then. And they take him, it says very clearly, to the, um, they led him to Annas first, where he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And so they take him to this guy's house, into this court, uh, in, into the actual courtyard there where Peter's warming himself, and uh, they're, they're in there. And um, you're like, how can this happen? I mean, we know that even what government in the world does that. If, if someone gets arrested, you throw the guy in the clink for a few hours, you wait for the morning for the whole procession to start. And so right off the beginning, this is all a mock that's going on. The other thing that not only is it the timing, but also who is he standing in front of? Now, he's standing in front of uh, Annas, for he was the father of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now, I'm reading from the, I read from the New Living Translation, but as I go through it bit by bit, I'm going through the Berean literal bi uh, Bible, and whatever your English translation may have or whatever other language you have, there's a bit of a discrepancy here about who, uh, wh who was the high priest. Was it now Annas or was it Caiaphas? Because it's a bit unclear uh, even in the Greek. And, and to complicate matters, it says here, uh, who was high priest that year. Well, we're talking about a mock trial. Not only is it at nighttime, who, who's the trial in front of? If it's in front of the high priest, there shouldn't be a question as to who the high priest is. Because we know the system from the Old Testament, if it was a genuine, a high priest is appointed for life. And he stays for life. But this is how highly politicized and corrupt the system was, that he was there for, it says, that year. And so as you begin to study this about how the whole Sanhedrin worked and the high priest, the, the corruption and the, the, uh, it developed into this old boys club. And, and, and so when the, when the guy actually you know, became high priest, well, then there was someone else for the next year. Well, what do you do with a guy who was the high priest? Well, you sort of keep him in there and uh, you create this, uh, this bubble of, of people who ran this society and, this, uh, and the people, they were the head of religious and they were the ones who, who were the negotiators politically with the Romans and uh, basically the power brokers religiously, financially and socially in many other ways. And so the whole thing was corrupt to begin with. It was basically, <laughs> very clearly, not Bible-based anymore. It, if they would have stuck with a high priestly system, you wouldn't have to identify, well, he was high priest that year because the high priest is continuously. And so he's got to make this comment as John's writing. He's explaining things. And I guess it's a subtle poke at showing that how corrupt the whole system was at that time. And so in, a, in any case, it's a, it's a whole mock that, that happens. Uh, who was Caiaphas? We read that earlier uh, in John. He was the one who had uh, stated and, and John repeats it here, advised that it's better for one man to die on behalf of the whole people than all the people to die. Meaning, meaning, let's snuff out Jesus and keep our positions uh, so that we, we don't uh, tamper with the Romans uh, here. We need to skip down now to verse 19. Uh, verses 19 to 24, because the mock trial now continues. There's an interjection of Peter's trial, but we'll, we'll take it one by one here. So let's go on, continue with the mock trial. Back inside, then the high priest, um, Annas, questioned Jesus about his disciples. Um, 
and about his teachings. And I love the answer that Jesus gave. This is wonderful. It's classic. I love it. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. And I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Okay. Uh, they, they didn't have a clue half the time what he was. Now part of that, what he was speaking, part of that was because they were based in Jerusalem. And most of Jesus' teaching happened up in Galilee. So we'll give them that part. But they, they knew, spread, the news spreads around quite a bit what, what he's being said because he started his ministry just outside of Jerusalem being baptized by John. And, and already at that time, Pharisees from Jerusalem would wander down the hillside and uh, go down to the Jordan and listen to what Jesus was saying three and a half years ago. And he simply said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so they knew that. And so now three and a half years later, uh, after multiple visits, of G which Jesus did to Jerusalem, he's now back into Jerusalem. And he, we knew, we, we were told many times that he would speak in the temple, in the courtyard, and he would publicly speak. And wherever he went, he publicly spoke. He spoke on the hillside with the hundreds, with the thousands. And that, that was his life, his ministry. Um, we as Christians, that's who we are. We follow Jesus. We, ha we have things on camera. We... Uh, uh, we, we have recorders, we, ha we have open, open doors, you don't see anyone stopping anyone coming in here. Uh, we, why? Because that's who we are. Um, we were in a church one time in a country where, where there was tremendous a animosity against Christ Christians, and in fact Christianity was not only the minority religion, it was a sliver, there's only a few believers, but there was a, a, a church there, and the government came to the uh, uh, church leaders and said to them, uh, please, you're welcome to have your church service for your people, your people, foreigners, <laughs> but not for ours. So please don't let any citizens of this country in. <laughs> so the leadership of the church gave a very biblical answer to that response. They said, we are Christians. We have to practice our belief. And our belief is that God wills that everybody be saved. So we don't post anyone at the door and say, no, you can't come in or you can't come in. Our doors are open for everybody. So they said back to the government, if you don't want your people in, please, you post your people in and you keep your people out. But as far as we are concerned, our doors are open. And uh, where do we get this from? Right here. Jesus was on trial, this mock trial. And they asked him, well, what did you say? And he says, I said things openly, publicly. Okay? And it's, it's always a thing to know. That's who we are as Christians. We live open faces. We live things. We don't, we don't hide things. We don't put things in, the, in a corner. and We don't scurry off and, and uh, say things secretly. We are open. We have nothing to hide. Jesus led the way in that. And it goes to show here the high priest, that uh, Annas at that time, he never went. He never went to listen. Why didn't he go? If he was really curious, why didn't he go sometime down to the temple and listen to Jesus? He could have. He didn't. Anyways, so they asked him, and, and Jesus responds this about the openness. He, he says, quest, Jesus responded, question those who have heard what I said to them. They know what I said. And in other words, he's even uh, willing enough to take the risk to say, uh, not just will I not tell you, but, but do me a favor Let's see if the hearers got it right. <laughs> Ask those who listened and to see. And so in a way, Jesus taking in this mock trial and turning the trial around and putting them on trial and saying, you do your homework and find out what I said by asking those who were out there listening. And uh, we, knew, we knew already where that uh, could have gone. Uh, we've seen that earlier in the chapter in uh, John 9 when the when the man was healed and they asked him about it, the religious leaders kicked him out of the synagogue <laughs> because he said, I don't know who healed me, but I got healed and I'm sure thankful. Later he finds out who healed him and said, Jesus. And they said, bye-bye, you're out. And they went to the parents, uh, who, who was this who healed your son? And they were scared spitless because they didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. And uh, so they said, he's old enough, ask him yourself. And, and uh, so Jesus always 
operated with this openness and this, and this transparency. A great lesson for us to learn. And he's talking here uh, at verse 19. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples. Very interesting because what hap- this is very key here. Because it's, it's not just the leader. It's the followers that they had to deal with. Now, we know, because we've got enough history, we, we know what's going to happen after the death and resurrection of Jesus. The persecution is going to come heavy on the disciples. Um, that always happens. And so they're asking about the disciples. Well, who are they? And what about them? And, um, and, and Jesus says, well, you sort them out. Now, the interesting thing is, right when he's asking this, one of his... Or, there's at least two disciples right out there in the courtyard. Um, and we see what happened with him. We'll get to him in a minute. Verse 22, And when he had said this, one of the officers standing by Jesus struck him, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Um, because of this constant shift of high priests, uh, Jesus probably didn't even know he was the high priest. He wouldn't have been dressed up, wouldn't have been, been in his garb, wasn't in the right place, so he wouldn't have even known. Um, but more than that, more than that, in verse 23, Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? And uh, this is now you can see the... Uh, the whole message and the philosophy and the thinking of Jesus, what happens. And I want us as Christians to learn this as well. And this week, again, in another visit with, with um, someone who is dealing with some rough times and issues regarding religious persecution, um, just to remind us all again that we do not defend the Bible. We don't defend Jesus. If you're ever trying to defend the Bible or defend Jesus, I'm here to tell you, Relax. <laughs> Don't do it. You're going to get yourself ulcers and sick. And uh, The Bible defends us. Amen. Jesus defends us. We don't defend him. He defends us. Right? All that our job is to do is to read the Bible, obey it, and, and follow after Jesus. And he's the one who will put his angels around us and guard us if we remain in him. It's very simple. Christianity is actually quite, quite relaxing. As Christians, we should be the most relaxed people, not in the sense of slothful, but in the sense of in our inner being, in our spirit, has to be relaxed if we understand this. And once we understand that, that we don't defend Jesus, Jesus defends us, it makes it so much easier. I wish I would have known that years ago, because I remember in school, as a, as a Christian, uh, being on the defensive, because even in Canada, Christianity is, is counter-culture, uh, the way it's going, the culture is going downhill, and as Christians, we strive to go uphill uh, morally and in many other ways, and so it's constantly, constantly going against the thing. And, and I remember too many times trying to defend the Bible. Uh, I've learned over the years, <laughs> just obey the Bible and uh, watch, watch God come to his own defense. He does a much better job anyways. I've learned that over the years. I, I really do. And that's what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, when you get hauled in front of the synagogues or in front of courts and you're asked to testify, he says, don't sweat it. Don't sweat it. We have only one homework to do. Read your Bible, pray every day. That's the homework. <laughs> and if we do that, he will bring to memory the things that we have deposited inside. Okay? Make sure our spiritual ATM is full so that when we go and we put the card in, we've got something to, re- to pull out of. And so uh, the lesson here of Jesus, he's, he turns it around to them as well. And they're trying to interrogate him, but he turns around to them and says, no. He says, you tell me what I'm doing wrong. And, um, and why do you strike? And so anyways, verse 24, so Ananias sent him bound again, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And so here they slap him around. He doesn't fight back. And they still bound Jesus. Wow. Amazing. Well, let's go on to the second trial. Uh, the first one was this mock trial. The second trial is actually Peter's trial. And this, again, is broken up into two parts here. Uh, Starting with verse 15. Now, Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. By the way, more than likely John, eh, the one who wrote this. Now, that disciple, meaning John, was known to the high priest. And and if you read history, there's uh, connected through relatives and so forth. uh, Entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But when Peter uh, was standing at uh, at the door outside, so the other disciple 
who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. And then a slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he says, I am not. Now, you've got to remember this scenario. Peter is a big, rough fisherman, okay? He's, uh, he's, a, he's probably a hefty guy, and he's, he knows how to uh, swing nets, and, and he's strong, and he's a burly fella. Uh, and then this little slave girl asks him a simple question, and uh, it just absolutely, absolutely, totally disorientates his rational thinking. Just a few hours before, um, let, let's look at the context. Turn back just a few pages to John 13. To John 13, and this happened just a few hours prior to this. In John chapter 13, verse 36, they're sitting around the table. Verse 36, Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. Well, why can't I come now, Lord? He asked, I'm ready to die for you. And Jesus answered, die for me. I tell you the truth, Peter, before the ro rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. Now, the other writers, uh, the other gospel writers pick it up and elaborate a little bit more on that, how Peter, no, no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And so here he allows this little girl standing at the door and asking a simple question to absolutely distract what he's thinking. And, and it's like his, his impulse to save his own skin produces a lie. Because the expediency at the moment was that he wanted to come in. And he didn't want to be identified with Jesus. Now, it's easy to stand back and point fingers at Peter. But when we read this as disciples of Jesus, at least when I read these stories, I read them and I go, how do I identify with Peter? And when I read this, this too many times is not a picture, but a mirror of how easy it is to put our own self-interests first. And to which John later writes in his letters, to him who has no sin, if I can paraphrase, he says, really? Really? No one's got any sin? No. But he says, if we sin, we confess our sins and then get on with life. And, and this is exactly what happened to Peter. It, it was just a few hours ago that, that Jesus told him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me. And here he just spits out a denial and more than denial, lied, denial, and uh, he doesn't even bat an eye about it, and he just walks past her and uh, goes to the fire to warm himself up uh, to see what's going on. And uh, we, we see that despite his boldness in so many other ways, it's so easy to allow self and our self-interest and the things that we need at the moment to come first before the kingdom of God. Now, thank God there's repentance. And John, of all of the gospel writers, picks it up at the, end of the, of, at the end of his book and shows the restoration of Peter, who I'm sure, we know, he was heartbroken. He, he, he wept and he cried about this whole thing. But uh, here we see his, his mouth exposed his heart. And it can happen so fast. Uh, we, that's why James talks about that. Uh, keep, a, keep a check on our tongues. It's the more, one of the most difficult members of our body to keep in control. Uh, my hand really doesn't flutter around very much. And when it does, it's activated by the brain. Okay? Uh, most of us are that way. And there's a dysfunction, and there's a, unless there's a nervous a malfunction, our hands would be shaking uncontrollably. But otherwise, we control that. But how easy it is for the other muscle behind the cage of our two sets of teeth <laughs> to... to to start flapping out things that are not consistent. But what it is, it's just a revelation of the heart, of the things that are inside. And uh, rather than get hard on that, use that. And this is what Peter happened. Okay, so you say something wrong. Life happens. It's a reflection of the heart. Don't just try to change the mouth and build a bigger cage around your tongue. No, deal with the heart issue. And ask God, God help me to change my heart. And when we change our heart, watch the mouth change as well. That this is how it works. It works with the inside. And so Peter had to find this out as well. 
So let's, let's uh, move on here, verse 18 now. Uh, so now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire for it was cold and they were warming themselves. Peter was also with them standing there warming himself. We skip down now to verse 25 because we're talking about Peter's trial. Peter here is actually on trial. Verse 25, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you are not also one of the disciples, are you? And he denied it. So he spits it out again. He says, I'm not. Now comes the third one, verse 26. And one of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again. And immediately the rooster crowed. You've seen the Jesus film. And uh, they, they, this is one section where they do it really well. They do it really well. And, and uh, Peter denies Jesus the third time. And then you hear the rooster crowing. And Peter begins to bitterly weep because he recognizes what's going on. What's the lesson out of this for us as we, as we look at this? Well, Jesus prophesied about this. He foretold about it. And it's not like, it, it's not like Jesus was making a statement of negative faith towards him. No, he, he was revealed by God the Father, by his Father. And this is the way prophecy works. And those of you that are either used by prophecy or understand prophecy and have prophecies given to you, this is how it works. Is that God, because he's above time and beyond time, he sees all things. We're just walking along this way, but God is up here. He sees what's coming down the road. And so he releases on occasion and speaks to his prophets who are walking alongside. And he tells them something down the road is coming. Okay, And it's not to be negative, it's just to give up a sight of what's coming out. For example, another classic one is when the, uh, the, the prophet tells uh, Paul when he's about to go to Jerusalem, he takes his belt off and he ties it around him. And he, and he just, he, it's not that the prophet knows anything, God revealed it to him and said, Paul, when you get to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to you. You are going to be bound. Okay. Now, I want to just make a comment here about prophecy. Um, Please make sure you just take the prophecy and then just leave it at that. And don't, don't bend yourself backwards trying to get the interpretation of it. Accept the prophecy, thank God for it, and keep moving. And keep moving. Because that's exactly what Paul did. Now everyone else around Paul at that time said and interpreted, don't go to Jerusalem. What did Paul say? I'm taking that prophecy, and with that prophecy, now I'm going with more confidence to Jerusalem. Because I know that that's going to happen, and that's perfectly fine. So prof we, we have this thing about news, right? You know, you've had that people come to you. Maybe you've done it to other people. I've got, some, I've got some good news or bad news. What do you want to hear first, the good or the bad? <laughs> to which a standard I've learned over the years, a standard response, which I say, just give me the news, and I'll figure out if it's good or bad. Just, just speak it. Uh, what is prophecy? What is it? Was well, this God revealing certain things? And so he had told Peter, you're going to deny me. So does that mean Peter was walking around seeing when he could deny him? No, exactly the opposite. In fact, in fact, it just goes to show us that what was in the deep recesses of his heart was simply exposed because his mind should have taken that prophecy, which was just a few hours ago, not weeks or months ago, but a few hours ago, in which Jesus said, you will deny me. And that should have been still in the forefront of his mind. And so even when that girl first stopped him at the door, he said, oh, no, just, uh, yeah, no, no. Um, he, he took the words of Jesus, and he put them on the back burner and took his own agenda and put it on the front. And uh, we have to learn as believers. We take the word of God, the prophecy here, other prophecies that are given, take it, run with it. And go forward. When things happen, what, what happened now with Peter, okay? And it took days for it to happen. And we see it didn't really happen until he had breakfast with Jesus on the shores of Galilee when Peter, or Jesus reinstated him. But the whole point of Jesus having told him that a few hours earlier, to show that God the Father, Jesus our Advocate, is not surprised by anything. He's not surprised by what we call successes, but he's also not surprised by failures. 
He's God. He knows all things. And He knows our weaknesses. He knows our struggles. And the beauty about despite the fact that He knows them, that He still works with them. Each one of us. He'll take us. This is a big lesson to learn for all of us. And this is how much God cares for us. He loves us so much, He tells us on occasion the future. And don't worry about it. Don't interpret it good or bad. Just take it and run with it. And when things begin to happen, deal with it accordingly, the right way. And in this case, it was a, it was a negative thing, and so he had to correct himself, which, which he did. Okay, enough of that there. Uh, let's go on with, with this here. Verse um, 28, And they led uh, uh, Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was now early, and they themselves did not want to enter into the Praetorium, so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Verse 29, Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation? Uh, th- yeah, this is the third one, right? Yeah. Uh, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him and said, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have him delivered to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death, to fulfill the words of our Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Now when Jesus, now we're moving from this mock trial to the the trial that Peter had, we're moving now to the trial in front of Pilate. In front of Pilate, two things happen. There's the public one and there's the private one. And, and in this public one, it's all the accusers coming up to him and saying about this, uh, you know, basically saying, kill Jesus. And uh, Pilate says, well, there's nothing wrong with this guy. Uh, you do it. No, they didn't want to do their own dirty work. Uh, they would have loved to. <laughs> it's amazing. They said, no, we can't do it. They had no problem bringing uh, this uh, lady caught in adultery and wanted to stone her right on the spot. They would have killed other people right on the spot. That's what they did. They stoned people, executed right on the spot. It was not nothing uncommon at that time. It's their own version of their religious law, which superseded the Roman law, uh, which allowed them to do that. Um, why on earth would the Pharisees ever pick up, uh, be willing to pick up stones there without a trial before the Romans, right in front of Jesus, and say, can we kill this lady? I mean, had they no fear of the Romans? And yet here, all of a sudden, for this, they have their own uh, agenda. They want to push the blame to someone else and say, you do the dirty work for us. Um, you learn over the years um, about the mentality of people. You got a job to do? Do it yourself. If you're not willing to do it, why ask somebody else to do it? Amazing, isn't it? And so they... Uh, they do this, uh, and, and, and Pilate is not dumb. He's very keenly aware of the political games that they're playing and the religious games. And they know, he knows, he probably heard enough about Jesus. Uh, this is some internal religious dispute, what's going on. And so he's, he's, he's toying with them a, a little bit here as well. And he pushes them back. And so what, what happens now, we move from this public one, we move to a private one here. And he calls now, look at verse 33. Therefore, Pilate again entered into the praetorium, and he summoned Jesus. And so now it's like this private conversation. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? To which Jesus responds, my kingdom is is not of this world. Let me just stop here for a minute and point something out here. In the verses between 33 and 37, many times the word king or kingdom comes up. This is a big issue. Now you have to remember who Jesus is. He's a simple man from Galilee as far as the human level is concerned. That's all what Pilate sees in front of him. He can tell by his accent. This guy's from up north. Um, uh, he looks at his disciples and he can see that, okay, they're, they're not from the upper echelons of society. These guys are simple fishermen and, and, and you know, tax collector and a zealot. And he's got a whole uh, hodgepodge of, of followers here, these dozen guys. Um, th- th- this guy clearly, clearly, as far as Pilate's concerned, is not a threat to Pilate at all. Okay, not at all. Uh, but yet he wants to talk with him. And so he has this conversation. And he comes to him very direct. He doesn't beat around the bush at all. Not at all. 
Uh, he says, are you a king? Now, keep this uh, interesting if we were to, to uh, compare all the different gospels side by side because when he comes in front of Herod, Herod basically asks him the same thing and Jesus says absolutely nothing. Why? Because Jesus has no time of day for Herod. None. None. Herod just represented this massive hypocrite uh, playing on both sides and uh, called him a fox earlier. Jesus uh, uh, knew how to uh, shoot out some pretty sharp words and had no use for, for uh, Herod at all. And as a result, when Herod questioned him, he doesn't even answer the question. But with Pilate, he, uh, when Pilate asks him, he, Pilate asks him in a civil manner, and so he speaks to him uh, back and, uh, and gives him the answer that he's looking for um, or answers the question, are you a king? And he says, well, that's what you're saying. Is it of your own initiative? Or is that just because of the things that you're hearing? And so the response is there. Let's go to 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, So, you are a king. And Jesus answers him now direct. Yes. Yes, that's what he says. Yeah, I am a king. And for this reason, I was born. And for this, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. I, you you, you got to picture this in the bigger scheme. And I can just imagine Pilate then realizing he is tackling something here way beyond him. Way beyond him. He's got enough religious education to know the religious views of the Jewish people, okay? Not to mention the, his, his own context of the Roman gods. Not to mention of the Greeks and their gods. Basically, at that time, everyone had a belief in supreme beings, in deities, who were much more powerful than them. And they also had enough uh, history, religious history, to believe, or at least it would have been in their frame to believe, that these deities come to earth. Just study a little bit about the Greek gods, the Roman gods, that sometimes they come in human form and are on earth. And so now here's Pilate, Asking him, are you a king? And Jesus says, yeah, I'm a king, but of a different kingdom. And he would have heard enough that Jesus came as the son of God. Uh, puts this man in an awkward position. Because everybody else, everybody else outside him and Jesus, the, the crowds that are out there, they're shouting one thing. Kill him. And if you don't, we'll say that you're an enemy of Caesar. And everyone else in that area for the next few hundred miles around recognized Pilate as the highest authority. And when he stands up and he walks over a few feet and meets up with the crowds, he's got the respect, at least up front, of being the representative of Rome. And here this simple Galilean, very simple, is standing in front of him and basically saying, yeah, I'm a king. In fact, a kingdom that looks down on your kingdom. No wonder Pilate was uncomfortable because now Pilate is on trial, not Jesus. When the religious leaders tried to put Jesus under trial, he flipped it around and put them on trial. And so Pilate is getting a bit nervous. And this brings us to the fourth one, is that all things end up being all of us, starting with the religious leaders, Pilate, Peter, and you and me. We all stand on trial before Jesus. All of us. Verse 34. Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or others tell you about me? So the choice here comes now. The, he's giving basically Pilate a choice here. Saying, who's telling you this? Is this the religious leaders? 
Is this the crowd telling you this? Is this Herod telling you this? Okay. Or if you read Matthew's account in Matthew 27, verse 19, he's saying, he would have said, in fact, he did say, or at least we can assume, that, or implied, are you asking this just because of your wife's dream? Okay. So there's so many people speaking into Pilate's life because she had just finished coming out and telling him, don't touch this guy because of that dream that I suffered. This, there's something different about him. And so all of these voices are coming to Pilate in so many different directions. And now Jesus himself is standing in front of him with absolute confidence in his future. He's not worried. He's not intimidated by Pilate at all. And he basically puts back questions to him and puts him onto trial. And of course, Pilate gets very, very uncomfortable uh, about this. Um, Verse 37, the second, uh, let's go on to 37, the second part, where Jesus says, yes, and for I am king, and for this I have been born, and for this I've come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate says to him, what's the truth? Famous statement, what is truth? What is reality? The word truth, reality, aletheia, uh, means it can be translated into reality. And this is exactly what Pilate was up against. You could sort of see him, in a way, okay, throwing up his hands and goes, I don't get this. I, this, is, this is beyond me. What is truth? What is the reality here? What's the real thing? He wanted to just let Jesus go. That's what he wanted to do. Because of the fear of man. Because of his position, because of this, he made the wrong choice. But again, we can stand back and point fingers at him, but that's not up to us to do. Pilate has to sort that out. You and I daily are on trial before Jesus. Why? Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. And daily, daily his word comes to us. And daily we have to respond to the truth. And sometimes we're in a position as well, and people ask, what is the truth? And uh, you can see that, whether it's at work or in different things, especially in politics, you can see that when, when nations go, and I think one of our neighboring, uh, for those of you from India, you just went through this with all the, the there's, you know, there's votes and there's politics, and there's all this stuff that's going on there. And, um, and, and some people are happy, some people are sad, and you'll never make everyone happy all the time. And you seize things, and, and, and there's all kinds of pushes one way or another. And, and sometimes you're, you're sitting between two parties and saying, well, this one or this one, and you don't know, and you ask the question, well, what is the truth? Well, as Christians, <laughs> as Christians, we should never be asking ourselves, what is the truth? Never, never. Never. That, those, those questions should not, not come out of our mouth. Why? Because Jesus is truth. That's reality. If we understand the word truth, it means reality. What's the reality? Jesus is the reality. And when we follow Jesus, we will be revealed the truth. Because if we're following after Jesus, I don't have to worry about the truth. I just have to follow Jesus. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the light. And as I follow after him, keeping his steps, I will be walking in the truth. That's how we go through life. And this is what Pilate had to find out and to go through these things. And, and Pilate there just washes his hands and says, I'm done. Uh, his choice was not good. His choice was not good. But you and I have that choice. And with this, I just want to close off for today and just remind us all that the li- our Christian life, uh, the, the trials that we face daily. Now, sometimes when we look at trials, we look at maybe the work situation or family situation. Maybe it's a financial situation or social. And we, and we think these things are the trials. Let, let's understand the things that we go through in life, all of these challenges that come to us. They're not trials because of these things. They're, they, they're exposing to us the trial of our heart. And that is in the trial of our heart is are we following Jesus? And if we follow Jesus and we stick as close as we can to Jesus, we will be sticking to truth. And we'll be sticking to reality. And by sticking close to Jesus, we'll start to relax a bit more. And what happens then, we can, you can have the waves of life and the storms of life and the winds of life can be blowing, but you can be relaxed in your spirit. 
And by being relaxed in your spirit, you'll know the truth. You'll know the way, and you'll know the right way to walk in it. And, and God says, just walk in this. That's why I've sent my son Jesus, so that you can walk in it. And this is the comfort I want to leave with us, is that we follow in after Jesus and give us peace. And as Christians, let us be the most peaceful people on earth. And so when difficult things happen at work and terms, turmoil things, be relaxed in our spirits because we know the truth. We know the way. Amen? Amen.